Coming up next, the bookening reads... Hey everybody, my name is Nathan Alberson, your humble and obedient host. I'm just going to be talking to Ghost Brandon for a second. Hey, Ghost Brandon. Hey, Nathan. How are you today? Fantastic. Fantastic. I'm glad. Jake is sending some very important texts right now, so he will be joining us in a minute. But I'll tell you about these texts. What he's doing is he's texting with a gentleman. They are helping put together the tables for our new studio. Wow. That we are moving into through generous donations from... Viewers like yourself. Is this is PBS. <laughs> As PBS would say, yes. Yes. <laughs> and a grant from the Lockman Foundation. And now I believe Jake is no longer texting. <laughs> yep. well, I'll tell you what this episode is going to be about, Brandon. This episode is going to be about how to read and tell us why we're doing this episode, why don't you? Why we're doing this episode? Yeah. It's, it was requested by one of our generous Patreon donors. One of our patrons, yes, sir. One of, one of our favorites, one of my favorites. I don't know how yeah. you feel about this person. I'm quite fond of this person. Quite fond of this person. Very quite fond. Very quite fond. You want to say who it is? Should we? I don't. Why not? It, it, you don't think it mind. is part of the Lovebird duo, Rhonda. Rhonda, yes. Your madre. Your madre. What is? This is the last time we'll be recording in this studio, Lord willing. Yeah, that's really cool. Or n- not in a studio in a Sunday school. Cl- last time we'll be recording in a Sunday school classroom. Yeah, we're in an yeah. old, out of the way Sunday school class in our church building. That will no longer be the case. We'll be in a studio. Thanks Exciting. Thanks to people. Thanks to people. Now, Jake, you're Beastmaster Funky Town. True. How are you today? Funky. All right. Guys, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's talk about how to read. Because yeah, that's what we're talking about. We that's what we're talking about how today. How to read a book. And this Figure is a very with... special episode. We had an extra month in January. Yes, that's the sentence that I intended to say. Oh. And so we decided to talk about... How to Read. This episode brought to you by Walter J. Adler. What's his name? Mortimer. Mor- Mortimer, Mortimer J. Adler. That's even That's a better. great name. A little bit like Bazooka Joe's best friend, Mort. You remember jo- Bazooka Joe's best friend, Mort? I do not. You remember Bazooka Joe? Do not. You remember Bazooka Joe? Yes. You remember Mort. Mort? Yep. He had the eye patch yep. and a turtleneck, kind of a Steve mm-hmm. Jobs number. Mort was always saying humorous things and then Bazooka Joe. Like gum. Would, yeah. It's the worst gum ever. Well, it became standard gum after you chewed on it for about an hour and a half, but yeah, it, it eventually like as hard softened as a brick. Up. Yeah, it was like you had to take the chunks that it shattered into and eventually soften it up and merge it into gum. Yeah, it's using only your tongue. Disgusting. This is like a hashtag '90s kid thing. I think nobody yeah, probably, probably knows what we're talking. Using about. You read the stupid your comic and you're excited about it because of the comic, and the comic's stupid. But you did get that gum. Yeah, but I got the gum. You got the gum, and it it's had like a, the gum that came inside of a pack of baseball cards. Same deal. That was pretty bad gum. Is that kind of gum? It's terrible. And then it had a comic that wasn't funny, but you're a kid, so you're just, you know. The chewing tobacco gum wasn't bad. Like little shreds of. Oh, Big League Chew? Yeah. Well, that that's a totally different thing. There's lots of things that weren't bad. Big League Chew's great. Yeah, Brandon. Yikes. This episode, we should say at the top, especially since we already brought this book up, is not ba- based on, it's not because we read the book. No, I've never read the read book. A book I never Gordon will Adler. read the book. I refuse to read the book. I don't want to know how to read. Yeah, no. I, I think it's a book worth at least skimming. I mean, I might read the book. I was just being silly. But it was the, written in 1940. I didn't realize it was that old. 1940? Yeah. That's like five years before World War II ended. Yeah, true. That's 79 years before we recorded this episode. I know. It's well before Strunk and White. Is it? No. No. That's a lie. <laughs> White was writing in, the, like, White was, yeah. or uh, Strunk, I mean, was his book probably came out in the... It's probably around the same time, to be honest. or the 20s or something like that. Strunk and White. All right, yeah. this book, this episode is about how to read a book. We're going to talk about how we read, how we got to be so awesome as we are. Yeah. And this episode, as I said, is brought to you by the book How to Read a Book by Mortimer J. Adler, which was a book that was influential for Jake. What's that sound? It's the airplane going over. It's 
an airplane going over. That's what I just said, indicating baggage check. Whoa. Part of the show, we talk about our baggage. Brandon, how did you learn to read so well? How did I learn to read so well? How did you learn to read so good, Brandon? How did I learn to read so good? How did you learn to read so good? How am I be so good? <laughs> <laughs> I think when you're asked, when you ask that question, yes. you mean how did I come to love reading and how did I come to read like I do today? Yes, yes, yes. I think the earliest instances of me loving, learning to love to read would be the lady who asked for this episode, my Mm -hmm. mother, reading us Little House on the Prairie, reading us, um, um, not E.E. Cummings, (laughs) E.B. White. (laughs) I don't know why I could only think of E.E. Cummings. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, reading us E.B. White, reading us Laura Ingalls Wilder, all these books, and she would read to us in the evenings, and she had a way of reading that made us love listening to the story. What was this way of reading that made you love listening to the story? I don't know. It wasn't just... Did I think it was voices because... And... She did some voices, but not really. It was just she has a great voice to listen to. Mm-hmm. I can confirm that. You could tell she loved the stories that she was reading to us. Yeah. And so, And she wasn't just like, oh, I don't have to do this now. She actually wanted to read to us. And so that instilled in me at a young age... Mrs. Chess is a story. woman who's completely sincere and does everything 110%. That's that my is, experience of her. That is very true. Yes, I think that's true. 110%. Yeah. Everything. Sometimes it can be everything hard to stay she, up. Everything <laughs> she sets her hand to, she does 110%. Yes. Conscientious, very sincere. That is that is true. And cheerful. We love you, Mom. We do. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was great. I had a mother who taught us a sincere, humble love of stories. Of course, I didn't always stay that way for me personally, but that was my early introduction to story. And I like it that my earliest love of literature came through E.B. White and through Laura Ingalls Wilder, who I'm sure we'll get to Wilder one day. No, I'd love to. I went through my dark period where I read books that were just trash around nine and 10, but then everybody knows the story where I found, well, at least listeners to the book inning know the story around 11, 12, I don't remember the exact age. My mom, again, encouraged me to read David Copperfield. I read David Copperfield, loved it. The rest is history. And actually then, so learning how to read and how to read well came from reading a lot, Mm -hmm. came from slowly seeing the parallels and the subtleties and stuff of the books I was reading. That comes with just having read quite a bit. But also, even more important than that, was having really great teachers. Mm -hmm. So I had a good teacher in high school, um, Sela Helms, and then another great teacher, Lloyd Newton. They taught some of these principles to me that, so he was always about figure out what the author's trying to say. What's the main point here? What are the main ideas he's using to get his point across? And then in the end, in fact, now that I think about it, he must have been an Adler disciple, or at least have learned from an Adler disciple, because then it was also always, why does this matter to you? Mm -hmm. Right? Why is this book important to you? And that was always very helpful and uh, eye-opening as a high schooler. And then moving into college, just continued great, uh, good teachers with uh, uh, Shout out to Ron Pitcock, who taught me how to read carefully and not to take myself too seriously. Mm. And I also learned from Ron Pitcock, the art of teaching. He was just an amazing teacher. When you bring too much of yourself to a book, that's where you'll end up liking Dostoevsky. Yeah. I I'm, I'm completely believe that. And, if, and Ron Pitcock taught me to bring humility to a book, I think. And he brought humility to his teaching style, too, which was, it was just fun to watch. So. One of the common criticisms of the booking that we don't bring any humility to books. Really? Well, okay. Except for also one of the common praises of the booking is that our conversations are unpretentious. Yes. So, I don't know how those go. Whatever. Together. People like to criticize your, things. Your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary. <laughs> Depends on what you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jake, same question. Two big early influences. One was uh, my mom taught me to read when I was four by making me memorize the first chapter of Genesis and King James while putting a finger on each word as I did. Hmm. So memorize the King James, first chapter of Genesis and King James, and got used to reading, just reading the words or recognizing the words as I went. And I don't remember after that ever like learning to sound like phonics or anything like that. I just that's what I remember as my learning to read, and from then I could just read. And then I read books, Richard Scarry books and whatever books to myself. The other, I guess, early formative thing was my grandfather was an amazing storyteller. He would read go- uh, those little golden books to us, sure. but he would always embellish them or change them or build on them, and he would do amazing voices and 
I loved from as young as I can remember just having him read or tell stories to us. He was hilarious. I mean, I don't know if he was hilarious or not, but as a kid, he was just hilarious. And his stories were hilarious, and I just couldn't get enough of Grandpa telling stories. As I got older, reading became an escape for me. Um, and it was pretty much, that's pretty much all it was early on, just a way to escape life. I don't know. Mrs. Culliver, my fifth grade teacher, uh, was a hard teacher. And she pressed and pushed and forced me to read books that stretched and pushed me and to think about them. And so I always think of her and bookending listeners will will know that she holds a special place in my heart because of that. I hated her at the time. And because I hated her because she pushed and challenged me and she did not accept any excuses from me. But it was one of the, that year was one of the hardest years of my life as a kid growing up because I was just coming into a place where I was processing my parents' divorce in a different and new way. They had divorced when I was five, six, but for whatever reason, it was just a really difficult time. She accepted no excuses for anything and she just pushed me and I hated her for it. And I've loved her ever since. And then the other really formative influence would be Mrs. McDonald, my freshman year literature teacher, who I've criticized on this show multiple times and have not come back around on her the way that I have Mrs. Culliver. And yet her stupid, ridiculous quizzes did force me to read and fall in love with the classics that did change my life and my view of fiction in general. And Is reading. she the one that we have to thank for you hating Dickens? Yes. I always thought that was Mrs. Culliver. I got them confused. No, no. Mrs. Culliver has nothing to do with Dickens. Mrs. Culliver is why I hate Johnny Tremaine. Yeah, well, Johnny Tremaine is why the world hates Johnny Tremaine. And then got into Clearing Up Pastors College and I had to read. I spent a summer down in Mississippi interning at a PCA church in Charleston, Mississippi, with a pastor named Andy Halsey. I had just finished my first year, I'm pretty sure my first year of the pastor's college, and he gave me Adler's book, How to Read a Book, helpful, influential book, in reshaping how I thought about books in general and how I approached reading. Adler gave me some tools. What The biggest thing things that Adler did for me was convince me that I should be marking up my books and not treating them as sacred artifacts, but only valuable to me insofar as I could devour them and really engage them and really ask the question, the the questions, what's this about? What are they trying to say? Is it true? Do I agree? And who cares? And to really argue with who I'm reading as I was doing it with a pencil in my hand. Mm -hmm. That was really helpful. And I don't think I read actually... I don't know. I don't remember if I actually read the whole book or not. Because he gets into the end, like how to read specific genres Mm -hmm. and i I think i probably pieced out on that i think i got what i needed from the early part and was done i wonder how many of the most influential things i've read have been things that i've only read a paragraph of of or part of or he's cool with that finished yeah he's a hundred percent cool with that sort of thing like he is so pragmatic i love pragmatism when it comes to reading he's just like you know you paid money for an artifact but don't treat it like an artifact it's it, this book is only a g- a good to you insofar as you're able to engage with it, hit your head against it, get it, get what's good and beautiful and true inside of you, reject what's not, fight through it, and you do whatever you have to 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 engage that. You take out a pencil, you dog ear the corners of the pages, you mark it up, you put in post it notes. It doesn't matter what it takes. Desecrate the book if you have to. It's not there for posterity's sake, the binding and the paper is not sacred. That's what matters. Mm. And that was the biggest and most important thing for me personally. Because I'm a, I don't know, I, I think I just had a, that weirdly prided myself on leaving a, uh, reading a book and leaving it in as untouched a state mm-hmm. <laughs> as possible. And then doing the show with you guys. Yeah, I was going to say the booking has been a learning curve in and of itself over the last four years. I mean, I'm a better reader today because of this show. Yeah, I'm certainly. I am, too. and I'm a better writer today because of this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's nice to be able to do it for something outside of yourself. Uh, my story is one of anger and rebellion. I mean, it really is. I don't know how to. There's no two ways about it. Every virtue that I have 
began as an act of defiance. I wish I could point to the great teachers in my life and the influential, but a lot of the way that I learned to read, if I'm being completely honest, and I'm not saying that this is a good thing, but this is just the truth, was as subterfuge, as rebellion, as sticking it to the man, because people are so hypocritical about the books that they like, and I just, I don't know. It's a long story. I'll give you my testimony one day if you come to Bloomington, but I don't like that kind of stuff. I never did. And so the principal thing, like, for example, I remember people being very precious, and maybe some of our listeners are too, and it's fine with their Bibles. You couldn't stack any. I went to a Christian school. You couldn't stack anything on top of your Bible because the Bible is the Word of God. It needs to go on the top. And I began to stack things as soon as I got to that Christian school on top of my Bible. And if anybody told me, I said, it's because the Bible's the foundation. So I actually put everything on top of it. That was my the snarky way that I came to get around with. I had a Bible that w- that I got when I was baptized when I was five or six. Mm-hmm. I got baptized around the time of my parents' divorce. And then we were in and out of church. That was the one Bible that I had. I was never allowed to read it. I, w- I remember multiple times wanting to read it or mm-hmm. to have it, and I was never allowed to. It's so obnoxious. Because it was my baptismal Bible, but there was no other Bible for me to read. Right. And so I couldn't, like it had to be kept special and precious. When I became a believer, the youth pastor carried around his Bible in the back of his pants, just like tucked in right back there. I I, t- I took up the same kind of habit. It was just like, oh, that's an easy way to just always have the Bible on me. And it was uh, stick it to the man kind of like, what good's the Bible if you don't have it with you, if you can't read it, if it's not available to you kind of thing. So I started doing that same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I kept it up, even though this particular pastor was the, is, I don't know if I should say this out loud. <laughs> Is he the inspiration for a character on another podcast? We'll say we'll 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 say he may possibly be the inspiration for a character on another podcast that we have. The most evil character we've ever written. It's possible. We've written some doozies. Yeah, but um, it, but anyhow, I, I want to finish the story because I started doing that and I didn't stop even after all of that stuff happened. Nobody ever said a word to me about it. Mm-hmm. Um, the first time I came to this church, I was rebuked for it by an elder. And then you stopped. I did, but I didn't stop because I stopped as an act of submission, not because I was like convinced. Yeah, it wasn't because for me, he was like, evangelicals have no respect for the Bible and don't, you know, care and show honor to the word of God and, you know, carry the Bible around in there. And I was just like, yeah, well, you have no idea who I am or where I'm coming from. Mm -hmm. But if you feel that strongly about it, that's cool. That's funny. Well, I had that experience of just being like, you know, I should be able to read this thing. And I remember somebody at some point, a lot of my things is a lot of my learning to read has actually been through the Bible, not to, I hope that doesn't sound self-aggrandizing because I'll judge just a second ago said they were all acts of defiance. And I think that they in some ways were. Somebody told me that they were going to read the Bible for an hour straight every day. That was their new devotion. Somebody my age, you know, some some punk kid, snot-nosed kid decided he was going to do that. (laughs) And then he would fall asleep and he wouldn't be able to, and his his mind would wander. You know, he was just telling me how difficult it was. And I just remember thinking, and that's dumb. It's not a magical formula. You know, the Bible does have real spiritual power. I believe that. But also, it really helps if you pay attention to what you're reading. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's... That's it's a, that's a really sacramental view, and that's one of the things that I think is true of evangelicals mm-hmm. when it comes to their devotions is that they're just a different kind of sacrament, sacra- sacramentalism. Where you know, if I just you, know, you make fun of of Roman Catholics or whoever because you know baptism makes you regenerate and the Lord's Supper sanctifies you, right? Well, evangelicals have the exact same kind of thing when it comes to their the, when it comes to the things like the sinner's prayer and their daily devotions. Their quiet time, yeah. Their quiet time. And so um, if I've said the sinner's prayer. I'm saved. Magic, I'm saved. And if I have my daily devotions, I'm, I am sanctified. And that, you know, it's a quantifiable thing. It's a vending machine kind of thing. You put the, the time in, you know, out pops sanctification, out pops holiness, out pops God's pleasure with you in that particular moment in time. And it's all based on that one thing that you did or did not do. And, and things like the time that you spent on it heightens the efficacy of it. Right. And so it's like, yeah, if I spend an hour staring at the pages of my Bible, God must be pleased with me. If I fail to spend an hour or if I spell, you know, that's a pretty extreme example. Sure. If I spend 20 minutes 
first thing in the morning, staring mindlessly at the pages of my Bible and falling asleep, then God's pleased with me. And if I didn't do that first thing in the morning, God must not be pleased with me. Right. That's my. Well, that's why my day wasn't blessed. It's because I didn't spend 20 minutes groggily looking at something that I wasn't paying any attention to or comprehending. I actually remember a pastor, I don't, I couldn't tell you who this was or what else he said or why he was there or what church this was even at. I think this was clear note, but a pastor came and he said, my, he told a story and he said, my wife was obsessed with reading her Bible all the time, could not make it through the day if she hadn't done it and was just actually making a weird, unexpected idol out of it. And I told her, you may not read the Bible for a week. This was his anecdote. It's always stuck with me because, oh, I remember that just like a little firework going off in my brain. Like, it's only actually good if you're if you're doing it well. And, and, and at a certain point, I gave myself permission to not read if I was too tired or if I just like messed up that day. And, it, you know, oh, it's one o'clock in the morning and I put it off all day. Am I going to now try and read something before I crash just to, so I can say I... No, I'm not. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending that. I actually think that was probably dumb and it is good to just yeah, make the, a discipline and yeah, a habit of it. It really is important that you have a discipline and that you give a little bit of time and that you accept the fact that not all the time that you give is going to be quality time. Yeah, I, I think that's true. But like I said, this is not the story of my virtue. This is a story. Better to do it poorly than not do it at all. Yeah, this is the story of how I did it for better or for worse. I'm not, this is a descriptive, not not prescriptive. And, and I began to see the same sort of sanctimoniousness. I'm sorry, I don't want this story to sound like I was Mr. Awesome and, you know, all my the authority figures were lame, like, you know, like dead poet society or something. But I began to see the same sanctimoniousness in my teachers and in other students with books. You know, people would just read something and they wouldn't even be able to remember it, but they'd, they'd check it off of a list. You know, there was people... I remember other students who they had just read something. And so that meant that they were smarter automatically. Like you've read such and such. I don't know what it would have been at the time. I, probably just the high school kind of canon like Gadsby or 1984 or whatever. Catcher you, in the Rye. Catcher in the Rye. And I, and I went through that period too where I was just devouring these things as quickly as possible and not paying a lot of attention while I was going. And there's a whole slew of books that I think I fell into that trap, that I don't actually remember them very well. I don't know that they really stuck, but I've always been able to say, I read Crime and Punishment. I might have been 11, but I read it. Now, Crime and Punishment is a good book, but it's, does, it doesn't really do a lot for 11-year-olds. If there's any 11-year-olds out there listening, I would encourage you not to read Crime and Punishment or a lot of the books that we talk about until you're a little bit older and be able to appreciate that. Here's an idea. If there's a book, for example, about sexuality or just about something more adult, it might help if you have a few more years, you know. So just having that kind of pragmatism was something I I should have been somebody that listened to my elders and read books like Mortimer J. Adler, but I kind of just discovered all this stuff for myself. And I sort of discovered it in an angry kind of way by s trying to do the opposite of the people that I hated and the people that I thought were phonies. Me and Holden Caulfield, we... <laughs> struck a blow against those phonies Good got it you. man Good so for you. yeah and, and then i went into the field and i caught the players as they tumbled off of that rye did so, you yeah literally literally yeah. yep i've literally caught people as they fall off of a flat earth kind of disc there's of, a famous flat earth section to bloomington <laughs> yeah yeah you know <laughs> that big gorge where it drops into the void yep and there's just a giant catcher's mitt that you can put your hand in yeah. catch people yeah I don't know. I was always wildly undisciplined. I always pursued the things that I liked much more than the things that... The one thing that anyone who's self-taught, that anyone that doesn't have a bachelor's degree like me will tell you, I think, is your, you can learn a lot, you can be smart, but it always tends to favor depth over breadth because you're going to really deep dive into the things you like and there's not going to be anybody cracking the whip to make you have the breadth of the things that you don't like. And that's largely been the case with me. I've had to go back and fill in a lot of gaps. Actually, that's been some of the fun of doing the booketing is filling in some of those gaps of things that I think most high school liberal arts students probably would just get in due course. <sighs> Something like Willa Cather is a good example. Like, uh, you know, I never would have thought to read Willa Cather outside of doing it for this show. I don't know that that's a very complete answer to the question, how did I learn to read? But basically just I was a scoundrel and I hated Pharisees and hypocrites. 
And I thought I'll try and do the opposite in a wildly undisciplined way. Hmm. And then God disciplined me and brought people into my life and gave me ordering principles and reasons to be more disciplined. And that's a big, long story that we won't get into. But sadly, that that stuff all came a little bit later in life, in my late 20s, early 30s, stuff like that. So I encourage you kids listening to have some discipline and to listen to your elders and not to just be rebellious, but also don't be a big fat phony. Do not be a big fat phony. No, I'm against being a big fat phony. What do you have to say to that, Brandon? About being a big fat phony? Yeah, or anything. One thing that bookending has helped me see as, or to put into words, is this point, which I think is a very important point, that books are not sacred. Literature is not sacred just because something is in the canon. Um, this is a feeling I've had for a while, and I, it started to really bother me with grad school. I was classically trained, which everybody who knows my spiel against classical education knows that I come from that world. Right. We would go to class, this teacher, Lloyd Newton, I guess it's not wrong to say his name. I don't, why, I don't know why he'd listen to this. Podcast, if you are, hey, Lloyd. Um, <laughs> Lloyd Newton. And he'd just get up there and he'd teach us Socrates and he'd teach us Aristotle and he'd teach us all these, you know, we'd talk about Hume and these other guys as though whatever they said is, uh, there's some sort of sacrosanct quality to the fact, to, to everything they say. And even if you're allowed to question it, even if you're allowed to argue with it some, there's still a sense that this is Plato, right? right. That this is Aristotle. And I think, I've always questioned that a little bit, but the bookening, so to add the bookening to my history here, really has helped me put that into words and to see that there's a there's quite a bit of fallacy there. Right. Just because you're in the canon, sure, but that doesn't make you holy writ, which gets to what you were saying with these Pharisees, who they think that just because you have looked at the pages and possibly read the pages from the cover to the end of The Great Gatsby... Uh, and don't understand a word of it, that that makes you a more intelligent and refined person. And there were quite a few people like that. English programs are full of these sorts of people. And so that I, I had that sort of experience too. I had the liberal arts training up through high school. So I got that sort of stuff that you were talking about. Right. But then my disenchantment happened. It's been a slow disenchantment with the university and to the point where I'm just kind of like good riddance because that's what it's full of. They just worship something different now, which is political correctness and multiculturalism. And at least that's what it was when I was there. It's queer theory now, probably. And right. Transgender, transgressive, transvestite studies. Fun times. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what well, I've been thinking there. Yeah. It's a real balance to be able to really engage with somebody who's written a book that is considered canon. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the great books in all of Western hi history over the past two, four thousand years. Yes. Right. And so you bring a certain degree of humility to that. Yes. Um, obviously, there's a reason why this person is respected. And they wrote a book that stood the test of time or seems to be standing the test of time. And so you come with a certain degree of respect and, a, and humility. There must be something here to learn on the one hand. And on the other hand, there's no way to learn anything unless you're willing to actively engage it and question, why is this canon? Why mm -hmm. does anybody care? What exactly do they have to say? What are they trying to say? Is it right? Is it good? Is it true? Does it matter? Who cares? And unless you're willing to actually ask those questions, and this is why I think that people criticize us for being proud or whatever, is because we're, we, we ask those questions, we try to ask those questions of everybody we read, mm -hmm. which... I think is us showing those authors the respect that's due them, right? They wrote a book, they're engaging, they're putting something forward, and the most respectful way to approach that is to say, okay, seems like you think you have something to say. What is it? Mm -hmm. Why? And who cares? Why should I care? Yeah, somebody and or other said, every book is a criticism of every other book. I, I don't remember who said that. Every but episode is a... No, 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 not, not, not about us. I just mean you cannot. Oh, every yeah, every yeah, book yeah, that is yeah. written is a criticism of the books. <laughs> you know, what of I'm every saying? other book. Like otherwise, this book wouldn't need to be written. When I sit down and I write a book, I could be R.L. Stein or I could be Leo Tolstoy. But either way, I am saying this is what should occupy these pages. This is what should exist, and this is what people should give their attention to. And you have to be willing to ask of any author, from the greatest to the smallest, why? Yes. Yeah. Why am I giving Says my, my yeah. attention to this? Uh, what made you think that this was worth my time? Right. And then you have to be able to answer the question, was this worth my time or not? 
why should I care about Should I care about this? Should other people care about this? Is this a book that I would pass on to my children or to other people because yeah. they should care about it? That's what's so dumb about so many professors, teachers, and literature critics out there is they, you know, like you said, Brent, and they treat it all as sacred, as holy yeah. writ, as sacred canon. And so it's just like, because I've come into contact with these things, I am now better. It's like touching the shroud of Turin or something. Like it's, it just rubs off on you in some magical way. That's not how this works. Yeah. That's not how it works Instead, at all. Yeah. No, it only is as good to you as you're able to understand what they're saying, engage with it, and ask hard questions of it. It, you are not benefited by Plato by coming to Plato as though he's holy scripture and yep. sitting at his feet and saying, oh, what a great teacher I've just learned from. You're benefited from Plato when you come to Plato and say, I assume this guy has something to teach me. What is it? What's good? What's true? What's right? What's wrong? And why should I care? And you should expect him to be able to convince you of that, to be able to convince you of what's true and to be able to convince you why you should care. And if he can't do that, he's failed. Or you're stupid, one or the other. One or the mm-hmm. other. And it is both, and it can be both, but you have to be willing to come and ask those questions. Yeah, and you have to allow it for the possibility first that you're stupid, but you also, and I think this is the other place where people maybe run into trouble with our podcast, you are a faulty instrument, but you are the only instrument that, can, that you can use. You are the only instrument for assessing that you have. And so I'm always very aware of how I'm responding to things, of whether something is boring me or interesting me, of what my instinctual gut reaction is. And it's one of those things that we actually spend a lot of time on the booking talk, like just how did you like, did you like that character, Brandon? Did you think this was good? And it's because, it's not because I want to be relativistic and say that the only thing that matters is how we felt about it, but it's just because our first tool for beginning to gauge is ourselves and to pretend like that's not true, to pretend like we are it's objective, it's sort of this yeah. critical creature that's able to just sit outside without and prejudice, assess something without, without feeling, without prejudice, without former, you know, without without baggage, without baggage. Um, that's why we have baggage check. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that you should always think that you're right, but you should always be aware of what you think. I think it's a useful thing to actually just ask yourself, if you want my first piece of advice for how to read, actually stop and ask yourself, what do I think? How do I feel about this? I actually think it's a useful, and then be willing to be corrected, be willing to go on a podcast and have Jake say, oh, that's stupid, and then, oh, okay, that is stupid. But start by not being fuzzy about where you're starting. You know what I mean? That's one of the things that Adler in his book is just adamant about. And I know I'm the only person here who's read it, and it's been like 10 years since I've read it. But I remember very clearly, he's like, you should be arguing with everybody that you read. If you're not arguing with them, then you're not engaged with them. That's why you have a pencil in your hand. Have a pencil in your hand and argue. Ask questions. Say, why? I don't understand. If that's your response, write it out. Articulate how you're thinking and how you're feeling about what you read. And then if you're wrong, at least you'll know it. You can figure it out. How how are you going to figure it out if you don't articulate your wrongness? You yeah, know? absolutely. It's a little bit like with an, an authority figure in your actual life, your pastor, your boss, your whatever. You can be deferential and you can be humble and you can also have critical thinking. These things can actually exist in the same brain, in the same space. And well, and that's the thing that, you know, it's so stupid. And and this is the this is the riff that we get on and we got on. I, I remember talking about this sort of thing when we were back in the Odyssey. People don't, they just don't want to be discerning. Mm-hmm. They don't want to think. They want to feel like they have thought, but they want other people to do the thinking for them. Mm-hmm. And so they don't want to engage with the classic with classic literature and say, why is this a classic? Do I believe this is a classic? Is this actually good? Is this actually true? Is this actually helpful? Is this actually worth? What they want is somebody else to tell them and then just accept Here's it. There's the transcendental truth this participates in. Yeah. And then feel good about themselves yeah, without actually engaging in something and being discerning for themselves. And that's the, yeah. that's the point. And that any good teacher, any good pastor is going to want you to grow in your ability to actively engage with, the, the, with all of the world that God has made and everything and everyone in it and every book in it that you come across in a way that's Christian, in a way that asks the question, is this true? Is this good? Does this honor God? Does this help me? Does this have a point, a purpose? Is it beautiful mm-hmm. or not? Yeah, I remember Roger Ebert had a when he was alive. The film critic had a famous uh, saying. His 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 number one maxim was uh, for all criticism was he said 
a man goes to the movies, a critic must admit that he is this man. In other words, there's so much of criticism, so much of thought, so much of intellectual, you know, so much of the university that wants to pretend to this objective, quote unquote objective, to this uh, people write or think as if they are simply observing the profound truth without actually bringing themselves to it and without thinking about it critically. It's fool's errand. You should give yeah. every author that's written a book the respect of questioning them. That's right. Of questioning what they said and why they said it, why they have to say it. You should really engage with them on that level. It, it does not honor anyone. It doesn't matter if it's Plato or Augustine or Calvin or Tolstoy or Dostoevsky. If you simply accept in an unengaged way. Oh, here's a crazy thought. I don't think it matters if it's Jesus. And that's not to say that the gospel isn't the inspired word of God that's perfectly true. But it is to say that being aware of where it rubs up against you and how you actually feel and how you respond and what it yeah, makes you absolutely. think and thinking about it critically. Yeah, is... the beauty of scripture is that is that you I'm sorry I cut you off. No, no. no. The beauty of scripture is that you come to it, it's all, it's most helpful to you when you're able to step back and say, This is what I don't like. This is what I don't agree with. This is what I feel bad about. This is what because that's where you know you're wrong. Yeah. And if you, in some act of faux piety, try and pressure yourself into just pretending like those feelings don't come and, and it never rubs up against you, you won't actually learn the lessons. In that's those not how you deal that with that. That's you. not how you deal with that. You, you have to come and take, you have to lay yourself down before God and say, okay, this is what you say. This is where I'm at. Help. Mm -hmm. Help. I, I believe you. I believe your word. And it is far from me. Yeah. And so help because I can't, I don't understand, but I want to. I'm having trouble accepting or grasping this. I know I should and that, and, and I want to. But being honest about that sort of thing, not in a defiant way, not in a I'm digging my heels in kind of way, not in a rebellious kind of way, but in a honest, I see you, I see your standard. I see what you've laid down, and I see myself over here, and there's a, a chasm, a gulf between the two, mm -hmm. and that's a problem, and I need help. I need forgiveness, I need grace, and I need to be changed and transformed in how I think and how I feel. But it, you can't go through that process if you're not willing to be honest with yourself as you, as you go through and honest with God as you go through mm -hmm. the Bible. And a lot of folk Christianity is just pretending that you're just of one mind with God all the time. And making a show of being of one mind with God yeah. when you're not. You're not honest with yourself or what's actually written. Nope. So that's helpful because one thing I've been thinking about is you have scripture, that's God's word. One thing that, and we've already talked about this some, but just to get back to it again, I think one thing that's helpful for me to remember when I'm reading a book is that this book was actually written by a person and that this book is not just something that's always existed as this book that has just been handed down to me by a voice that was Homer's. But Homer was actually a, a man. He was he lived in Greece. He was most likely a violent man or whatever it was. Homer, he wasn't trying to teach me some transcendental truth. He didn't have this purpose of being the great wise philosopher teacher when he wrote Homer, most li when he wrote the Odyssey, most likely. Right? It was a very different relationship we have to books than we have with the Bible. Right? But I think that people forget that a lot. And this was what frustrated me a lot with grad school, was deconstruction and postmodern theory, they all had killed the author. And so all that was left was the text. And so it was all about you and the text and how does, and how do you respond to the text and how does the text respond to you and all that. And so I think that it was, it was just inevitable that today that would get mixed in with the way we think about art. And often we just forget about the fact that art is created by a person. And so that Shakespeare could be wrong. Shakespeare, mm -hmm. Shakespeare could have body things that shouldn't be in Shakespeare. Shakespeare could have sonnets that don't work because he was a man, just like we are, right? And it's perfectly fine to read a Shakespearean sonnet and have a line where they, hey, Shakespeare, really? Come on, <laughs> right? There's no way Shakespeare could be perfect every single line that Shakespeare wrote. Maybe that's going to be controversial. It probably was perfect. It's just old English. You don't, you don't understand. Yeah. You don't get I'm it. I'm sure that's the response that most <laughs> people would have to me. But I think it's been eye-opening to There's see things. There's some double entendre there you can't possibly understand yeah, because yeah. it's been lost in translation. Yeah. It's been eye-opening to see things that way for me, mm -hmm. that it's perfectly fine to think that Shakespeare was fallible. It's perfectly fine to think that Tolstoy was fallible and that the ending to Anna Karenina is bunk, right? right? Even though the rest of the book is beautiful, but he failed there. And to know why he failed there, because he was Tolstoy. He was crazy. 
he wrote that book, What is Art? Where he just rails against ballet for like 50 pages. Even though I agree somewhat with what he was saying, he's still crazy. It's not like he's entirely yeah. wrong. About he's not it. wrong. He's just he, no. he's crazy for going on that long about it. <laughs> I came out of grad school burnt out with that sort of thinking. And so then maybe it's helpful for people who get frustrated at some of my takes on the bookening to realize I bring that awareness of... So there are two things. One, we forget about the author and we idolize and worship the text over anything else. Mm -hmm. Because that's what it leads to. The grad school would never... Professors would never say they're idolizing the text, but that's what it leads to. That's what they're doing. That's what they do. And then they turn around and accuse Christians of... Yeah. They do that. And then also what it ends up... It it ends up in a sort of narcissism too, because all you do is whatever view you have of the world, you then put back on to every book you read. Right. Which is why Jane Austen's a feminist. That's why she's a feminist. That's why for classical educated people or classically educated people... Maybe a lesbian. Probably. I mean, she didn't get married. Yeah. I mean, she was probably a lesbian. And so you just see this problem and this issue with lots of readers. And that's why suddenly Homer becomes like, I I keep talking about this, but it just really, I don't know, it gets me that for some reason you have people out there who think that Homer was like- Great moral teacher. The Nirvana teacher that we all need to go and sit at his feet. And you're just like, really? Seriously? Did we read the same book? How in the world did the Odyssey teach you everything that the Bible- uh, I mean, apparently that's the way they talk about it. It has just as much good food for you to eat. And you're just like, that's that's absolutely insane. What you're doing is you're, you're more taking- out of a chapter of First Samuel than yeah. all of the Odyssey. What you're doing is you're taking your entire understanding of Greek philosophy, Roman philosophy, all these things, and then also your nostalgic view of your own understanding of the transcendental values of the world, and you're putting them back onto a book, and you're assuming, I mean, you're, you're reading into, you're just reading into it. And that's bad reading. That's getting a book to say what it doesn't say, and that's mm. bad reading. That's exactly how you can get the Bible to say what it doesn't say. And that's, that's that same sort of frame of mind when you approach a book can lead you to really awful things. Yeah, well, I just, uh, my, my, my girlfriend is, or my, my fiance, I should say, she submitted her paper to a, a conference that, that does uh, different r- religious and philosophy papers some of the, some of the she sent me the brochure some of the papers in there just just to give an example of what Brandon's talking about here's an example of a speech that's being given at an academic conference control your women colon silencing and subordination of women in the acts of the apostles mm-hmm. you guys know how the acts is full of full of women in general first of all lots of stories about women in acts yeah and they're all being silenced and subordinated well, the yeah. demoniac Slave girl in Philippi. She had to be silenced. So. Paul's. Uh, another one is have the mind of Christ. Notes towards a mad Christology. <laughs> she speaks for herself. <laughs> www.theologshe.org websites as praxis of Trinitarian inclusion. <laughs> <laughs> Read that one again. No, no, this, that's too good. Oh, I, I do love it. It's uh, <laughs> she speaks for herself, colon, and then it has a website. www.theologshe.org website as a praxis of Trinitarian inclusion. Theologshe? Theologshe? As a praxis of Trinitarian inclusion. The motif of identity in the Gospel of Mark. So my only reason in bringing those up is you see these things that anyone with common sense would say, you know, okay, let's say you believe whatever crummy stuff these people believe, fine, but you're taking these texts and you're just making them into that. And yeah. and these texts actually, whatever their virtues or vices, don't have a lot. The, the Acts of the Apostles actually, minus a few small incidents, I'm going to say it doesn't have a lot to do with gendered inclusion and sex roles. and Yeah, I have fun sometimes thinking about if Shakespeare were to come to modern day Harvard or something mm-hmm. and sit down with some professors who teach his works, and they tried to tell him what they think he meant with Hamlet, and he'd just be like, oh, I, I just thought the play was kind of fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a good story. Story. In fact, I mean, that was like, you guys are like reading like draft five. You should have seen draft 10. Some of the stuff I added, man. <laughs> yeah. <But> yeah. <laughs> we have begun to make some headway on this discussion. I think we're going to have to do a part two, though, because I want to talk because we've we're, we've gone over our time already. And I want to talk about more practically speaking, what do you do when you read a book? Do you, you know, do you, do you listen to audio books, guys? Do you underline? Do you use a pen? Do you use a pencil? Do you skim first and then go back once you try and really get it the first time do you use spark i want to talk about the mechanics 
of how to read a book well and how to get it to stick in your brain and how to do something useful with it. And we've only begun, we we sort of covered the philosophical side today, which is, I, I guess, the moral of the story is pragmatism, deference mixed with what? The kind of respect that leads you to <coughs> really actively engage everything you read and as if yeah. somebody has something to say to you that you should take seriously and question. So and then not to take yourself too seriously. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing. And we'll talk more about that next week. Is that okay? Everybody on board with that? I'm on board. Yep. Okay. So, all right, let's shout out our donors. Uh, the, the woman of the hour, Robert. Well, he's not the woman of the hour, but he's married to her. Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds, Brandon. Robert and Rhonda, the lovebirds. Jake, the immortal Chelsea E. The immortal Chelsea E. We are really enjoying reading Persuasion, and we're going to give you some good episodes on that. Chelsea, coming up as soon as we mm-hmm. do the, finish this two-parter. Nathan, not me, Brandon. Nathan, not Nathan. J- little... Uh, no, no, no. What's uh, Jimmy Beam and Little Annie Oakley, Jake? Jimmy Beam and Little Annie Oakley. Lily of the Valley, Brandon. Lily of the Valley, Nathan. Andrew and Esther, the lovebirds, and little baby Timothy. Little, little babies, Timothy and X. Andrew and Esther, the lovebirds, oh, and little babies, Timothy and X. The inscrutable Jenny Z. The inscrutable Jenny Z. John and Jill, the lovebirds, and little baby Max. John and Jill, the lovebirds, and little baby Max. The Keith Master. The Keith Master. Oh, Jake. I have so many trucking needs, so many transportation needs. Well, so many you things. should take your needs to David's Mighty Men Transport. You should. That sounds like a good plan. David's Mighty Men Trucking. My beloved mother, Beth. Nathan's beloved mother, Beth. The dark, no, what's, what's Jeremy's again? The dark hooded lord of death. The dark hooded lord of death, Jeremy. Jeremy, the dark hooded lord of death. The incandescent Meredith. The incandescent Meredith. What have we Joanna. seen? Joanna. I did it for you there, buddy. Thanks. Maya. <laughs> Maya. Maya. Ryan and Judo Judy. <sighs> Rock and Ryan and Judo Judy. Danny the Dude. Danny the Dude. DJ Sammy G. DJ Sammy G. J. Katie. And family who are cold and love cheese. Jay and Katie and family who are all cold and love cheese. Yes. Mm, Benny and the Tiberiuses. Benny and the Tiberiuses. Tiberii, I suppose. Benny Eric, and the Tiberii. Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds. Eric and... We've already done them. We did them. Oh, John and Jill. We did Eric and Catherine, the lovebirds, and... We did Robert and Rhonda and John and Jill, the lovebirds. Did we do Eric and Catherine, uh, the lovebirds? For sure. Weird. What are their babies? Timothy. Little, Timothy no. and Baby X? No, uh, little baby Silas would be Eric and Catherine. Are you sure it wasn't Andrew and Esther? Oh, that's who we did. Yeah, Andrew and Esther. Eric and Catherine the Lovebirds and little baby Silas. And of course, Professor and Lady X. Professor and Lady X. Thanks for listening, everybody. was written and produced listened to by you you didn't write and produce it others did that but you listened to it all the way to the bitter end good job and it is bitter it, it is. is bitter but you yeah. can make it less bitter by going to www that stands for what jake World Wide web patreon.com forward slash what brandon the booking and you can do what there jake you can give as little as a dollar a month Ten dollars a month if you want a donor shout out, um, and if you want a super nice copy of every book that we do with inscriptions by each of us, usually drawings by Nathan, mm-hmm. then you can uh, give fifty dollars a month, and we'll hook you up for a crisp, clean fitty. We and these are nice we, copies. We we fitty books. Uh, we've been going with. Uh, I know. We, we recently praised Every Man's Library, but we've been going with Penguin Classics. Yeah, those are nice. Uh, hardback, Smithstown, very nice. Really enjoy them. That's the kind of quality that you will ex- you can expect from us. Uh, the best quality book that we can find. We'll send it, we'll inscribe it, send it to you. 
uh, for fifty dollars a month, and you won't have to think about it. You'll just be able to read along. You'll get it plenty of, in plenty of time to read before uh, our episodes drop. We're recording this episode. We've not recorded episodes on persuasion. We've not mm-hmm. recorded episodes on Lewis Carroll, and we've not recorded episodes on Jane Eyre. Right. But our listeners have all. That is correct. They're received. They should have all received by now. Some Jane Eyre might, may be in yeah, the mail. Someone might be waiting on their Jane Eyres, but. But all of those books have been purchased and are and signed and sent out. So yep. signed, sealed, delivered. That's right. Well, thanks for being here, Brandon. Thanks for inviting me, Nathan. You're welcome. Thanks for being here, Jake. I'm glad to be here. Goodbye, listener. We'll see you next week for more booking. Mm-hmm.